Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to have you all back here, and very specially, I greet the uh, the people who are, who are coming for the first time. And um, uh, as you know, we have the, the the pleasure this evening of having uh, the author of this great book, Liberation Theology. Uh, Mr. Julio Loredo. Uh, Julio Loredo, when he was still a uh, basically a teenager, had to uh, had to leave Peru. He was born in, in Peru. He had to leave Peru because there was a uh, um, a military dictatorship who. Uh, who obviously in the beginning pretended uh, not to be exactly what they were, but little by little it became obvious and they, uh, they began persecuting um, conservatives in general, conservative Catholics, etc. And uh, uh, Julio had to leave uh, Peru and it was in a certain sense a, a blessing for the for the TFP because he went to, to other countries and uh, uh, he had been a founder of our group in, in Peru. He went to other places and, and spread, uh, spread the ideals and the ideas of, uh, of traditional family and property and then ended, ended up in, in, in Italy, a nice place to end up in, um, in, in 1994. And uh, he he helped develop our our whole operation. We have we have of course our our bureau in Rome, which uh, deals with all the uh, the questions you you know about the uh, all the ecclesiastical things, etc. But we also have an office in in Milan, where uh, where um, where uh, Julio. Uh, works and um, and he, he he became the president of the Italian TFV. He's, a, he's an Italian citizen of course and uh, um, he has dedicated his uh, his uh, studies etc to the, the the question of liberation theology 
and um, uh, people accuse us of many different things. One thing that uh, it's very difficult to accuse us of is not having uh, uh, predicted uh, what was going to happen with the church. Uh, Professor Pino Correa de Oliveira, as early as 1928, began to understand the crisis of the church. People think the crisis in the church began yesterday. Well, it didn't. And uh, so uh, in, in 1943, Professor Pinto Rivera wrote a book in Defense of Catholic Action in which he presents exactly the situation uh, as, as, as we have it now. He predicted very much what was going to happen if nothing was done. Well, nothing was done. It only got worse. And uh, at some point, the liberation theology became the... Uh, the instrument that the left utilized in the Catholic Church to promote the, uh, the, the leftist revolution. And uh, so uh, Julio began studying liberation theology when exactly? 73. 73. Mm -hmm. In 73, he began studying liberation theology. And uh, liberation theology today has, has conquered most of the church, although um, we don't see the uh, we don't see the priests carrying uh, machine guns and the and the the beret, the boyne, how do you call that in the beret, huh? beret, beret, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, as you did very much in the 60s and 70s and 80s, but uh, they are dominant. Liberation theology is 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 dominant, and uh, is dominant at the highest levels of the of the church. So it is absolutely fundamental to understand the phenomenon to better be able to uh, to fight it. So this is why we um, uh, this is why we wrote the book. This is why we we have published. Uh, editions in, in, in several languages and now we have the English the the English edition here in the United States and uh, we're very happy to be able to hear directly from uh, from Julio about the uh, the whole issue and at the end of course we, he I'm sure he will welcome your questions please uh, Please welcome Julio Rivera. I've been asked by our expert over here that everybody please put your telephones on airboat mode because if not, your phone, even though you don't realize it, can interrupt the transmission of the uh, this, this wireless transmission that's going out to I don't know how many people, but over 200,000 people received the link about two, three hours ago to watch what we have tonight. Any questions? He's the man. Thank you. <clears throat> well, thank you very much for the uh, so the generous and rosy introduction. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you especially Mr. John Harvard, Vice President of the American uh, TFP, and Mr. Mario Navarro, who has been the person in charge of this Washington Bureau uh, for so many, so many years. I'm very happy that we follow the, uh, the Roman wisdom. You know, the old Roman said, prius manducare de inde philosophare. You got it. First eat and then do philosophy. <laughs> Not the other way around. Which was a translation into Latin of the old Greek wisdom. The Greeks invented the symposium. When you speak about symposium, you think about a uh, doctrinal meeting, a meeting where you discuss philosophy and ideas, etc. Well, that's not what symposium meant in, 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 in old Greece, <clears throat> in ancient Greece. Symposium was after the meals, women would go on their side and men would go uh, on, their, on their side to drink wine and discuss philosophy. And this was called uh, the symposium. So it was nice wine and philosophy, but first they had eaten. So that's the correct order of things. Well, 
I have to say also that I'm ful fulfilling a promise because two years ago, a bit more, uh, just before COVID, uh, I was here and I presented the subject of liberation theology on a much more theoretical basis. Now we have a book and have a concrete situation, which I will explain afterwards. And um, I, I, I told you, uh, we are translating this book into English and let's hope to have it ready soon. And maybe next time that I come here to Washington, uh, well, it's Virginia, but you know what, what I mean by Washington. Um, I come here uh, to Washington, we will be presenting this book. So this is a, uh, the promise that we, meaning myself, but especially the American TFP, are uh, fulfilling. I must say two words about the story of this book, the, or the history of this, uh, of, this, of this book, which began in the United States. The 1980s, some friends of ours in Texas called our attention uh, to the influence of uh, groups linked to the Catholic left. Of course, Catholic between a thousand quotation marks and left underlined, because ah. that's the correct vision of this Catholic left. The action of the Catholic left, especially in the southern border, especially uh, with uh, immigrants or Mexican Americans or uh, 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 Chicanos. <clears throat> there was a huge operation going on. Huge operation that saw the confluence of uh, the groups that come from this progressivist Catholic uh, line called BCCs, Basic Christian Communities, BCCs in, in Portuguese, they're called CEPs, uh, Comunidade Ecclesiais de Base, Basic Ecclesial Communities, it's the same thing. The con confluence of this BCCs with Alinsky type people's organizations. So it's a huge network spawned by the IAF, the uh, Industrial Areas Foundation, founded by Saul Alinsky in uh, Chicago. It's now operating out of New York and it's called the IAF Alinsky Institute. With the background of liberation theology as a doctrine. So you see, there was a blueprint for revolution in the United States. You would say, well, this is there was Southern Texas. Southern Texas is not the United States. Well, Southern Texas is the entrance gate, the entrance door for the rest of the countries. I was shocked when I came <clears throat> two years ago here uh, to the uh, United States. I landed in Maryland. Um, I had been here in 93. So it was almost 30 years since uh, I last came. I was shocked to see that every single sign, even in Maryland, was bilingual. Mm -hmm. So you see things have changed a lot, and this was supposed to be a blueprint for revolution in the United States. Now, the American TFP, um, um, prompted by some friends uh, in, in Texas, Catholic friends who wanted to do something, uh, contacted me, who I was already studying American issues. You see, I, I, I speak fluent English. English, in, indeed, it's not my mother language, but it's my second mother language. The first one is Spanish. But anyway, I was already not only studying American issues, but as uh, Mar Navarro said, I had been studying liberation theology since 1973, when I was 18. Why? Because we did, in Peru, we did the first campaign against liberation theology in 1973. 11 years before the Vatican even noticed it. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we, we say in Rome, in the Vatican, even to high-level uh, officials. Look, we saw it 11 years before, and they have to accept it, they have to uh, admit it, because that's a fact. So they contacted me, and knowing very well that I was also in very close contact with Mr. Luis Solimeo, here, uh, he lives in Spring, he lives and works with us in Spring Grove in the Central uh, American T uh, TFP headquarters. He has been studying liberation theology for so many years. He even wrote, uh, to, together with his brother, a, uh, an excellent book, which is the book of the TFP about liberation theology, of which I took many uh, points for, for my book. Um, and their book also was, um, was used also by Professor Plinio Correa de Oliveira to write an uh, epoch-making book, a bestseller, uh, Denouncing Liberation Theology. If I'm not mistaken, 86, was it? 84 or 86? 
78, 78. Did you see how things go back then? So I say that because I would also like to recognize the role Mr. Luis Solimeo had in the writing and revision of this, of this, of this book. So I began to write it, and the idea was to write a series of booklets uh, dedicated to aspects of this blueprint for revolution. <clears throat> and a doctrinal book that explained things in a, in a, um, in a deeper sense. I mean, the, the doctrines behind this. So we could then be able to affirm things without having to prove them very much. If anyone wanted the proof, it's in this book. That was the idea. What, what happened? First, the whole thing of liberation theology began to, to wane. The whole thing began to shrink. First, because of the condemnation of John Paul II, half a condemnation that needs to be said. But anyway, it was construed as a condemnation of liberation theology. I'm speaking of the uh, pastoral instruction Libertatis Nuncius in 1886, followed by the uh, another uh, instruction Libertatis Coscienza in, eight, in 1986. So then uh, John Paul II had a very strong um, speeches in, uh, in the CELAM, CELAM is the Latin American Bishops Conference in Puebla and others. He made a visit to Peru, I think in 84, and he spoke very strongly against liberation theology. So the whole climate in the, cha in the church changed and liberation theology began to go into uh, troubled waters, so to speak. Then, the very international situation began to change a lot. Because for them, paradise was the Soviet Union. And they say, I, 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 I'm going to quote them. Well, the Iron Curtain fell in 89. The Soviet Union was dissolved in, uh, in 91, substituted in, in February 92 by the uh, present day Russian Federation. Uh, Cuba began to implement uh, some free market sealed of free market to open itself up, et cetera, et cetera. And Latin America, which was their playground, began to swerve to the right. There were conservative governments elected almost everywhere uh, in Latin America. So the whole situation changed. And even in Texas and in the United States or in, in the Southwest and in the rest of the United States, all this thing began to uh, to Wayne to come down. There was uh, uh, Reagan, then Bush Senior, etc. The whole situation changed, and we decided not to publish this book. So we kept it in the drawer, and I called it the book that never was because it, it, it was there waiting. Well, situations change, and this is a very important thing. We tend to think that history always goes in one direction univocally. Well. History changes. It can go back and forth, up and down, and sideways. Um, Jorge Mario Bergoglio, Cardinal Jorge Mario Bergoglio, was elected as Pope Francis. And with him, the whole situation in, in the Vatican changed. You can imagine the difference, even in the human type, between Pope Benedict and him. He comes from a tradition, I can explain it a bit afterwards, he comes from a tradition which is parallel to liberation theology, which is called people's theology. That is liberation theology minus one or two secondary aspects. First thing he did, he called to the Vatican all the exponents of liberation theology, beginning with the founder, Father Gustavo Gutierrez, Peruvian. He presented his books in the Vatican with all support from Vatican uh, authorities. Um, several liberation theology bishops, uh, Bishop Blas de Avis, for example, later Cardinal, uh, today Cardinal Blas de Avis was named um, to some charge, high charge in the Vatican, in a congregation, etc., etc., and the liberation theology began to be readmitted in the church. The buzzword used in Italian was sdoganare. Dogana means custom. Sdoganare means to take out of custom. You know, when some, some uh, shipment uh, arrives, it, it arrives at custom, and then you, 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 uh, you have to clear customs. Clearing customs in Italian is called sdoganare, and it's a word that they use 
that something that was underneath is shown publicly. It is esdoganato. The, and the buzzword was this, liberation theology was esdoganata, was, was cleared from customs. And it went on to the point that the spokesman for the Vatican, Father Federico Lombardi, um, said the liberation theology is now part of the life of the church. So this monster whom we thought had been eaten up by history, this, uh, this um, smoke of Satan that we thought was already out of our sight, all of a sudden we see it come back in the heart of Christendom in the Vatican. Parallelly, Pope Francis begins, began to convoke international meetings of the so-called popular movements. Popular movements are the extreme of the extreme left in Latin America. Terrorist, Marxist, subversive, etc., etc. He, he has already hosted three of those meetings, two of them in the Vatican, one of them in Rome, outside the Vatican, but with his uh, sponsorship. So the whole movement of liberation theology came back to center stage, and by center stage, I mean the Vatican. Well, we, American TFP and myself, said, well, why don't we take this book from the drawer and publish it? So we translated it. I translated it into Italian because it was originally written in English. It was updated, etc., and published in Italy, where it actually managed to uh, not call, not break, but to diminish this influence of liberation theology because people saw began to realize what the real problem was. Well, then of course it was translated into Spanish, Portuguese, and then into English. Um, you can't imagine my surprise. I come from a uh, from a conference tour in California and Texas. You can't imagine my surprise when uh, speaking in Texas, I began to speak about this and this and that, and people began to raise their hands. No, last week in my parish, we had a meeting with an IAF organizer who came from New York. I, and I asked, there was a, a lady, said, ma'am, did you discuss the holes in the streets of your neighborhood? How did you know? I said, because that's, that's the Alinsky blueprint, uh, uh, blueprint. And they had founded something called the TMO, I don't remember what it stands for. She said it, but don't remember what it stands for. And the diocese has, this is Houston, officially called on TIAF organizers to organize the Catholic parishes in Houston. So the whole thing that we thought that had be, gone literally down the drain, I found it right in front of me while giving this, this meetings. Then there was a lady from San Antonio who said the same thing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Not to go further, have you seen pictures of the Oval Office now? There's a beautiful statue of Cesar Chavez. Who Cesar Chavez is the Alinsky guy who organized the Delano grape, uh, grape strike in 66 or 7, I'm not remember, in California, which was the springboard for all the movement of liberation theology. And that was Cesar Chavez. So this guy is officially inspiring the president of the United States of America. When you put a statue, as we put the statue of St. Peter's here, it took us because this is our inspiration. When you put a statue of Cesar Chavez, that it's like proclaiming that you are inspired by him. And all sorts of people that are now in office, Ocasio-Cortez and several others, who by the way was elected on a socialist slate, linked to the Democratic Party, but her Slade was uh, social demo the socialist democratics of America, Democrats of America. And when you uh, read her, uh, her, her, uh, her speeches, what's her basis? It's BCC, basic Christian communities, linked with the Alinsky network. So I was really impressed because given these lectures in California and in Texas, I realized that I was not given something theoretical. I was given something that is coming back even here. Exaggerating a little bit, but not so much, we can say that liberation theology took hold of the White House. In the sense that all this movement is now 
governing your country. Um, well, so this book couldn't be more timely. This book couldn't be more uh, uh, modern in the good sense of, of the term. And this is why in the, um, in the last uh, chapter, in the closing, I call it, this is, I said, this is not a read book. This is a read and do book. Because this is sort of the ammunition that we need in order to uh, um, appraise, to analyze objectively what's going on in our country, our country meaning the United States of America. Well, um, what, what can we say? I, I will not summarize the uh, synthesize the book because this is not the object of a presentation. The presentation is meant to whet your appetite to buy the book. Uh, who, do you know, ha, ha, have you heard the name, he died already several years ago, the name of Father uh, Wedinfeld van Straten, the founder of the Church in Need. He was a fantastic fundraiser uh, for his uh, uh, organization. It's an international pontifical uh, organization, Church in Need, which helps the church in countries that, where the church needs help. And he would give, he, he would make these huge gatherings, uh, fundraisers, and he would say, ladies and gentlemen, the entrance was free, the exit is not. <laughs> well, I'm not Father uh, Van Straten, but I can repeat what he said. But anyway, <laughs> my role is not to synthesize the book, is to whet your appetite. But we can start at this point, something Mr. Mario already mentioned, and it's how I would. I would normally begin this uh, this uh, presentation. The we're Catholics. What happens in the church is automatically the most important thing that uh, that can be. Um, and it's obvious that we are that that Holy Mother Church is in the throes of the worst crisis in its history. The church has seen many crises in its history, but nothing. I mean, but not even far compared to what she is experiencing today. Now, when you mention the crisis, and all the popes since the 1960s, they all have mentioned the, uh, the uh, crisis, have denounced this, this crisis, especially remember what Paul VI said, the church is in, in a process of self-destruction. And then he said in 1972, um, the smoke of Satan has penetrated the church. Through some crack, the smoke of Satan has penetrated the church. Now, the, the natural question to ask is, what is this crack? Who opened it? And what is the smoke of Satan that penetrated the church? And when we ask this question, as Mr. Mario Navarro said, a natural answer is it all began in the 1960s. This is 1960s stuff. It's Second Vatican Council. Uh, Every evil that, we're, that we have today in the church began with the Second Vatican Council. As if one day before the council it was paradise, and one day after it was hell. Second Vatican Council has had its role in this crisis, and a very important role, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's also a question just of reading history. But it was not the beginning of this, of this crisis. If any... If anything, it was the consequence of this crisis. I remember speaking with a Slovakian bishop, uh, he already died, uh, Bishop Dominic Tocht, and he said, look, people discuss council yes, council no, this and that. F there is a revolutionary river that comes way before the council. Then came the council. Some people say that the council was an attempt to build a dam to block this river. Others say that the council was a tab that opened more the waters. I will not discuss this. I will only say that this river existed before and it existed afterwards much, much larger with much more water. And where does this river come, come, uh, come from? And that, that, I mean, I start my analysis very directly because you, you, obviously you can go much further back, but from the French Revolution. 
Because you see, liberation theology and its consequences, because we will see that we are now facing neo-liberation theology or new liberation theologies. There's what we could call, between thousand quotation marks, the classic liberation theology, Marxist liberation theology. And now, just as the revolutionary process is going into new phases, into new forms, all liberation theology is also following this development. But liberation theology was born from the confluence of two currents, very intimately linked. One current of so left-leaning or leftward social activism that began in the 19th century with the so-called social Catholicism, became this, uh, toward the end of the 19th century, first years of the 20th uh, century, the so-called democratic Catholicism, in which democratic means socialist, which gave way to, so, to Christian socialism, which yielded liberation theology. On a theological and philosophical level, there was another current that began with liberal Catholicism in the 19th century. Toward the end of the century became modernism, which created, later on, created the so-called new theology, nouvelle theologie, as it was called by Pope Paul, uh, Pius XII, which created liberation theology. So it's a process that comes back all the way from that, from that time. Well, what characterizes these two currents? And this is a very important point because it will also help you to understand what the American TFP or what, what the TFP does and why we do what we, what we do. We can describe these two currents as the party of those Catholics who wanted to embrace revolution. If you see all these heresies and all these movements, they all boil down to one point, adapt the church to modern times. That's the bottom line. That is, there was a revolution in society. We are modern, we want to be modern, so we have to adapt the church to this situation in the world. See, for example, what um, a, one of the leaders of liberal Catholicism, Count Charles de Montalembert, said, we liberal Catholics, we take sides with the great revolution that gave birth to the new society, to the modern life of peoples. We accept, we invoke the principles and liberties proclaimed by the French Revolution. That is, liberal Catholicism was not born of a group of Catholic intellectuals that all of a sudden began to think and discuss, and they, they concluded that Christianism had, had to change. It didn't happen this way. It began with the French Revolution and then with the desire to adapt the church to the French Revolution. And in order to do that, you, you have to change the church because, of, 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 of course, uh, it's not adaptable. Modernism. We say that, and, and St. Paul V, the 10th, when he condemned modernism, he said he defined modernism the synthesis of all heresies. The original Latin text is a bit stronger, omne ereses coletanium, which literally means the sewage toward in which these heresies flow or into which these heresies flow. And that makes sense because synthesis of all heresies, how can you synthesize opposing heresies? But when you say, excuse me, there's a lady that etc., but that's what the Pope said and a saintly Pope is the sewage into which flow all the heresies, so the dirty waters of the heresies. But when we think about modernism, with, of the crisis in the church, many people said, it's modernism, it's modernism. It, it is, but again, what's modernism? Modernism was not born out of an intellectual effort to uh, they, they began to, to think and discuss, and all of a sudden they concluded that they had to change theology. I quote from the program of the modernists, because, you know, the, when St. Pius X condemned the modernists, they, were not, they didn't call themselves modernists. It was St. Pius X coined that term, modernist. And they were stupid enough to publish 
the program of the modernist and say, yes, sir, we are modernists. And this program of the modernist is the synthesis of modernism written by them. They say, who are we? See, we're, we simply want to be Catholics living in harmony with the spirit of our time. Period. That's modernism. So there's a spirit of the time, which I suppose is good because it's modern. Therefore, I have to adapt that in the church, which is not modern, which is not in accordance to the spirit. And um, I'll just one last quote very quick. You will say that uh, problems like for, or questions like, for example, the Novus Ordo Misa, you know, the, the, new, the new mass. Um, promulgated by Paul VI in 69 and then regulated in 1970 with the Institutio Generalis Missale Romanum, you would say that this is an exclusively theological problem, exclusively liturgical problem. So if we oppose the new mass, we have to oppose it on a theological level. See what they say. Number 12 of the Institutio Generalis Missale Romanum. We had to change the liturgy in order to accommodate the church to the requirements of these times, period. If there hadn't been these times, there wouldn't have been a Novus Ordo. As simple as that. See the council. What does the council say in the opening words of the uh, Gaudium Espes? This council was convened to open a new dialogue with the world. That's it. We want to change the, the church, convoking an ecumenical council. Why? Because we, have to, we want to dialogue with the world. And we cannot dialogue with this world being the, the church as it has been up to now. Which takes us to say, if there hadn't been this world, there wouldn't have been Second Vatican Council. So... You see the importance of fighting revolution in society. As I said in the beginning, what happens in the church is in absolute the most important thing because the church is the mystical body of Christ and Christ is true man and true God. So automatically, every theological problem, liturgical problem, and ecclesiastical problem is in itself the most important thing. But strategically speaking, it's more important to fight revolution in society, strategically. Because if there weren't revolution in society, there wouldn't be these heresies in the church. They all, all are simply infiltrations from secular society into the church. Now, uh, for just a couple of minutes, I will have to go. I know it's a bit late. I know it's a bit warm. But uh, for two minutes, I will have to go into uh, theology so we can understand what we're talking about. Um, how did they want or did they uh, purported to adapt the church to the modern times? How did they want or uh, intended to change and work in your way down to the foundations or blow up the foundations and the whole thing just tumbles? It's like you normally do with a with a building, you know, these demolitions. I don't know if there's an engineer here, but, you know, they put it, demolition charges and it explodes like, and the whole thing collapses. Or a lumberjacks, you know, they, they, they cut the tree by the bottom and, and the whole tree falls. What's the foundation of the church? What's the foundation of theology? What's the foundation of religion? It's the concept of revelation because religion is based on revelation. Revelation is man, through his own natural means, he can know some truths, not all of them. Uh, so he will never know all the truths. For example, the mystery of the Holy Trinity is impossible uh, for man to uh, conceive it. And he will never be 100% sure if that is a true because he knows his intellect is fallible. So even if he rational deduces certain things, there's always an element of doubt because he knows, we know that our, in, uh, our intellect is fallible. So God, in his infinite mercy, he revealed himself to man. And this revelation is was given in the history of the Jewish people, Old Testament, 
and it reached its completion with the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, with the incarnation. So everything our Lord Jesus Christ said was revelation. He associated to his mission, to his re 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 revelation, re revelation mission, I don't know how to uh, ad, uh, say the adverb, um, um, the apostles, 12 apostles who were officially charged with being bearers of revelation. So what the apostles said or wrote was also revelation. Well, this revelation, which is called public revelation, ended with the death of the last apostle, St. John the Evangelist, I think around the year 100. And it's ended, it's finished. And this is the so-called depositum fide, the deposit, deposit of the faith. It, and it's contained in Holy Scriptures, what's written in Holy Scriptures, and in tradition. Tradition with a capital T, this is a, a theological uh, a, a concept, means all the revelation that came from our Lord Jesus Christ, but was not written in the New Test uh, Testament, but transmitted by the church itself. And this is tradition. Well, all these heresies, they destroy, they, they deny, excuse me, they deny and thus destroy the, the, the idea that revelation is closed, that revelation is finished. They say that revelation continues throughout history in many ways. For example, the modernists, I'll be very, very quick. I said that I was going to be two minutes, it's already three, but anyway, just one more minute of theology, then we'll go straight into something more, more practical. What did the modernists say? Say, we modernists, uh, and this is, uh, excuse me, not we, this is Father Le Breton who was uh, uh, attacking, who was uh, 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 confuting modernism. That modernists understand revelation very differently from what the church understands. Every man feels it directly in his soul. I feel my revelation, James Bascom feels his revelation, etc., etc. It is not a divine manifestation of truth, but an emotion, a search of the religious sense that surfaces from the depths of the subconscious and in which the person discerns a divine touch. So the modernist outrightly denied that God is a person whom we can know. It's a philosophical error called agnosticism. God is a stirring within myself that I can feel. And this feeling, they call it a religious sense, um, I, if you read the Encyclical Pascendi that condemns modernism, you will see the a, a longer and more detailed uh, explanation of all this. Now, I ask you, if each one of us has his own, not even truth, but feelings, what's truth? The very concept of truth is cancelled. It's not even denied, it's cancelled. You can't, can't even speak of a truth if you accept this, uh, this uh, approach. The new theology, well, excuse me, modernism was condemned uh, by several uh, documents of Pius XII, the, the several allocutions, and finally two documents of 1908, the decree. Pius, Pius X. What did I say? Well, excuse me, it's St. Pius X. First, in the um, decree, Lamentabile Sane Exitu, I think July 1908, and then the encyclical Pascendi Dominici Gregis two months later. Um, con and he not only condemned modernism on the doctrinal level, he actually began to excommunicate, he actually began to close down magazines and publishing houses, forbid uh, congresses, etc., etc. Well, there's a very interesting letter, 1910, written by an Irish-English uh, modernist, George Tyrell, writing to a, an Italian modernist, Father Semeria, or Father Genocchi, and he says, we're finished, this Pope destroyed us. Our time will come in 50 years when, through a secret work, 
we will have managed to infiltrate the church. And this is quoted in the book. So they, uh, they, uh, uh, they hid, literally hid, in what an Italian modernist, Antonio Fogazzaro, called a, a Catholic Freemasonry, the masonry of the catacombs, and which St. Pius X, this time I, I, I got it right, St. Pius X denounced in 1910 in the Motu Proprio Sacrorum Antistitum, in which he says the modernists have regrouped in a clandestinum fedus, in a clandestine league. Well, this clandestinum fedus began or continued a secret work throughout World War I, throughout the 1920s. I remember re reading, uh, you gave it, gave it to me, the memoirs of Countess Cécile de Corlieu. Uh, she was a modernist. Well, she was having lunch in a monastery, 1921, 1922, having lunch in a monastery which was known for, uh, for being very modernist. And she was very, very feisty, you know, because modernism, modernism, modernism. And the abbot says, Madame, Madame, don't say that word, but, but let us continue our work. So let us continue our work, but don't say that word. Many years later, in 75, one of the leaders of this current, which uh, Pius XII, and, and, and this is Pius XII, will call Nouvelle Theology, New Theology, Father Do Marie Dominique Chenu, he said in 1975 in a famous interview, he said, we strived uh, on, to do two things. One, to reword, reframe, reformulate the modernist errors in terms that couldn't be, um, that, that, that didn't fall under the condemnation of St. Pius X. That is, the same errors with a different um, cloth. And he said, we invent, we, we strive to come out with la, la belle formule, the beautiful formula. That is a, a phrase or a word or an expression that can be interpreted on this side or on this side. That's an art. And this is an art that these people were uh, perfectioning already in the 1920s. What happened in 1920? three, I think, or two or three, Pope Pius XI reorganized the Catholic laity. Uh, there had been Catholic lay movements already since the uh, 1900s, in the 1800s, but he reorganized the Catholic laity, forming the modern Catholic action, which was organized in the so-called specialized groups uh, university Catholic Action, Students Catholic Action, Women's Catholic Action, uh, Sailors Catholic Action, uh, Farm Workers Catholic Action, et cetera, et cetera. These new theologians said, this is our chance. So they jumped into the bandwagon and infiltrated large portions of Catholic Action. And this is when all these doctrines that were restricted to intellectual high circles became Grass, a grassroots phenomenon because they infected the grassroots of the Catholic laity. I was speaking with someone before, for example, speaking about the United States, and this is already in 1930s because the Catholic action arrived here and in Latin America in the late 1930s. Father Andrew, Andrew Greeley, uh -huh, uh -huh. well, Father Andrew Greeley, he writes in, in the book, the, the Chicago Experience, uh, the, the, the History of Catholic Action, and he says it right out. Um, we infiltrated traditional Catholic associations and either co-opted them or destroyed them from the inside. And he was, he was speaking in, in, in first person. I mean, he was part of this. Uh... So you see, what was just doctrines restricted to very intellectual groups and what's more secret groups became public and grassroots widespread. Now, in, in order to speak about the United States, I have to, because I, I see that the time, time is running a bit too, uh, too fast. 
Um, but anyway, here we have to speak also about a personage whom you maybe all already know, Saul David Alinsky. He was born in Chicago in 1909, died in, Sacra in, in uh, Carmel, California, uh, seven, 1972. Right after giving an interview to Playboy in, in which he said, if hell exists, there's where I want to go. And he, were, he, he died at 63 years old with a massive heart attack. Yeah, when he hit the ground, he was already dead. Uh, he, he had the uh, uh, attack, he fell as he was taking his car, and as he hit the, the ground, he was dead. Well, he began his, uh, he, he was a natural rebel, a natural uh, revolutionary. He began his, his career uh, with the uh, uh, Communist Party of the United States. I, I, I've never found out if he, if he was actually a member of the Communist Party, but he worked with the Communist Party. He was the fundraiser for the Abraham Lincoln International Brigade that fought with the communists in the Spanish Civil War. But he immediately, he was very intelligent, um, he immediately realized that communism in the United States would go nowhere. So he said, this is not the way to, to do a revolution here. So he came out with his old idea of a people's revolution, that is the creation of thousands and thousands of local people's organizations that will organize the have-nots and do little revolutions here and there to grab power from the haves. And he said, if we have many thousands of these little local revolutions and we grab power uh, little by little from the haves, all of a sudden we will have a nationwide revolution and that's the blueprint for the United States. Right away, oh, well, little parenthesis, he said, so everything boils down to power. How do I learn how to use power? He knocked at the door of the Lexington Hotel. Remember what the Lexington Hotel was, the headquarters of Al Capone. Al Capone. He knocked at the door of the Lexington Hotel in Chicago, which was the headquarters of uh, Al Capone and his band, the Coco San Nostra. Um, and he said that he wanted to work uh, for them. Al Capone saw that he was a valid person, he was, but he was too young. So he said, well, just hang on here and, and just learn. And he did some errands for the uh, Al Capone. Um, we, can't, we cannot say that he was a mafioso, but he himself says, I learned the politics of power from Al Capone. Well, I close, just, just to see the type of person as he is, he was. Well, he was intelligent enough to, to perceive that without the church, he will go nowhere. And he says, I perceive that without the support of the Catholic church, I will go nowhere. But with the support of the Catholic church, we will be off and running. That, Exactly what he said, off and running. So he, there, I, I, I've read all these things. I don't remember the detail, how he approached Catholic action uh, in Chicago. He approached the, the diocese and the curia. And he was very well accepted by Bishop Shield, Shield and, um, and who uh, named Monsignor John Egan to be his, uh, his, his, uh, his shadow person. And the Diocese of Chicago hired him to teach the seminarians how to organize their parishes. This is early 1940s. Well, at a certain point, he became a professional revolutionary, a professional organizer, and he founded the IAF, the um, Industrial Areas Foundation, in which Barack Obama graduated, by the way. Um, Alinsky also invited Hillary Clinton to be part of the IAF. She said, thanks, but no thanks, because I, I have higher, higher goals. Mm -hmm. And indeed, she was marrying uh, Bill. Huh? Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, but her thesis, Hillary's uh, uh, doctoral thesis in Wellesley College is about Saul Alinsky. And, uh, excuse me. And one of the first things uh, her husband did when he was elected was an executive order sealing her thesis, 
So you, you cannot, uh, the most that you can do if you're a researcher with a letter of presentation from, from a very prestigious university, you can read the newsletter in the archives of Wesley College, but you cannot take photocopies or anything. Well, anyway, from there comes, speaking of the United States, from there comes this symbiosis between the Catholic left and Alinsky, the Alinsky uh, populist or people's left. Now, and this comes from the 1940s. Now, to go back to the place I was uh, explaining, because I only have five, five, uh, five, uh, five more minutes, these new theologians, they, they said, revelation changes in history. Uh, revelation has to be discerned in history, and they make a three-step uh, reasoning. First, revelation happened in history. True or false? True. Our Lord Jesus Christ was an historical personage, so revelation happened in history. Second step, so we have to study history to understand revelation. Yes, in a very secondary and parallel way, for example, if I were to study uh, Jewish history and I, I, I get to understand the concept, uh, how the Jewish people saw the lilies of the fields, what was their perception of the lilies of, of, of the fields, I could better understand our Lord's parable when he says, behold the lilies of the field. No, you know that parable. The, yes, but it, it, it's a very secondary aspect. So it's true that studying history, you, you can shed light on some very secondary aspects of Revelation, but it's not studying history that you will understand Revelation. Then you come to the third step. We see Revelation in history. And this is why what a, 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 a critic of new theology, Father Germano Pataro, a former... Um, a professor of theology in the uh, in the um, patriarchal seminary of Venice, he says the new theology highlights the historicity of revelation, certainly in the sense that it occurred in history, but more radically in the sense that historicity is its very hermeneutical principle. That is, you interpret revelation through history. Now history changes, and then there was a very a very revolutionary reading of history. Say what Father Chenu says. Revelation comes to us through the progressive socialization of human life. Revelation comes to us through the develop development of the working class, through the social activism of women, through the organization of international consciousness, through the liberation of peoples under colonial rule. Another new theologian, Father uh, Congar, Yves Congar, says, Revelation comes from the social economic liberation of workers, the liberation of colonized peoples, the wars of liberation, the liberation of Vietnam. It's a source of revelation. The war, the Viet Congs were a source of revelation. The liberation of women, sexual, uh, sexual liberation. And, the, and, and this is 1950s stuff. Father Conga. Well, you see, liberation theologians, and I will go really fast for the last two or three minutes, liberation theologians simply take this idea of a revelation occurring in history, and they say, well, if it occurs in history, it has to occur in what history has of more dynamic, more radical, more modern, and that's communism. Socialism and communism, which back then, 1960s, was the most advanced aspect of the revolutionary process. Now we are into something else and even worse. So they said, communism and the kingdom of, of God on earth are one and the same thing. Father Cardenal, Leonardo Boff, we see inestimable goods of the kingdom in the Soviet regime. 
the Soviets are building a project that is fundamentally ordained to God's projects, et cetera, et cetera. You will find all these uh, quotes in the book. It's full of quotes like this. Well, to go straight into the uh, conclusion, 1990, 1980, excuse me, the liberation theologians made a worldwide congress in the uh, mother house of Marignold in New York. And they discussed how to get rid of Marxism, how to get rid of communism, because they say communism is going down the drain. I mean, communism is falling down. We cannot fall with it. We have to think of something else. So they took the essence of their ideology, which is the dialectical struggle between oppressed and oppressors, or uh, the oppressed against the oppressors. In quotation, classical liberation theology, this oppression was an economic oppression, Marxist style economic uh, oppression. But they say we have to find out new oppressions in order to proclaim new liberations. And they came out with several new panoramas. For example, um, certain races are oppressed, blacks are oppressed, black liberation theology, of which Barack Obama is a follower through uh, 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 Jeremiah Wright, you know, the, it's a, a black pastor in Chicago. Uh, Indians are oppressed, Indian liberation theology, indigenous liberation theology. <clears throat> <clears throat> Women are oppressed, feminist liberation theology. The earth is oppressed by man, ecological liberation theology. And this is what Father Boff says, to the cry of the people, we have to substitute the cry of the earth, Mother Earth. Homosexuals are oppressed, gay liberation theology. So you see, I explained this doctrinal core of all these theologies that is manipulating the concept of revelation to show that this is a, a, a blueprint. How, how do you call it here in the, in the United States? Plaster. Uh, when the uh, boys, uh, boys uh, children play, you know, pla plaster. And the, well, now they play with iPhones. Play doh. Play doh. Play There's several color plaster thing, and and they, and they make them, and they make. Free. Well, today they uh, play with iPhones. I mean, they don't play with that anymore. <laughs> but play doh. So you see, these doctrines are, are a play, though, that can be adapted to any circumstance in which I see that there is a situation of oppression. Now, two new liberation theologies are going very, very strong. Ecological liberation theology. We even had an encyclical based on, econ on ecological liberation theology, Laudato Si and indigenous liberation theology, which presents the Amazonian Indians as being the model for our society. Why? Because they don't have private property, they don't have hierarchy, they don't have structure, they don't have state, they, they have nothing of, that can oppress, that they don't have any oppressive structures. So that's full liberation. You say, come on, that's outlandish, that's absolutely crazy. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we had a synod in the Vatican based on this indigenous doc, indigenous theology. So you see, we are not speaking about things that are up there in the clouds. We're speaking of things that are affecting Holy Mother Church very, very directly. Um, not only at this level, you know, the Panamazon uh, synod and things, but here in the United States. And as I said, I was impressed for, uh, with what I heard in Texas. I spoke already with Mr. John. Uh, we're going to analyze the situation a bit more to see what's going on and if all this thing is coming back again at this, at this level. Excuse me, 30 seconds, may I? One last and horrible contradiction of liberation theology is this. They say they are in favor of the poor, but then they support regimes that produce poverty. And this is why they met um, in 1990 and studied head on this problem. And they concluded that this is a conclusion from an international liberation theologians 
uh, Congress in Madrid says the option that imposes it itself today is no longer between rich and poor, but between two conflicting principles, that of wealth and that of poverty. We must make an option for poverty. We must take the principle of poverty as the foundation of everything. And indeed, they speak every single evil against the United States. But I don't know if I'm mistaken, but all I see is a northward flow of people. <laughs> I don't see any American taking the raft. Well, they, they will take the yachts down to Latin America and fleeing the uh, obnoxious poverty that has taken over the United States. And this is the truth. I mean, this is not ideology. This is the truth of facts. And they are so cynical, the only word that can describe them, that they accept it. They say, yes, sir, we want poverty. And this is why, and I really close with this, I, Benedict XVI, in a book that was uh, the, the, the friends um, recalled Pope Benedict, or something like that. It was witnesses by several friends of Pope Benedict who speak uh, about him. And then there's an interview to Pope Benedict. And he says, the very, uh, the very, uh, one of the very first uh, problems that we had to tackle with John Paul II, he was a uh, uh, congregation for the doctrine of, of the faith, was the problem of liberation theology. And he says this, it is precisely for the poor that we have to oppose liberation theology. So this is not a preferential option for the rich against the poor. This is a preferential option for the poor but a real option. I mean, we want to improve the poor slots, not uh, sink them by giving them a lead-laden life jacket. Well, excuse me, I, I overstead Mr. Mario's generosity by two and a half minutes. So thank you very much. <laughs> Few questions. Right? Mm -hmm. Our 